afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is John Roschke. And before we get started, I would like to give my personal thanks to Mike Rugel and the National Museum of American Jewish Military History for hope hosting this seminar today. Um, the second thing I'd like to do is I'd like to send a big shout out to all of my family and friends for attending today's webinar. And today, as we review the book, uh, I hope that you will see another side of the Vietnam conflict, one that is from the perspective of an American advisor. Now, everything I talk about today is in my book. And as we go through the presentation today, I will share pictures and talk to the pictures uh, from Chung Tien province so that you can visualize the experiences mentioned in the book. Uh, Mike has already shown a picture of my bio, but uh, I grew up poor on a farm in northwestern Illinois and was the second oldest of 10 children. Um, you, here you'll see a picture of me at age seven uh, doing my very best John Wayne impression. I enlisted in the Army in 1966 with the thought of uh, getting a marketable skill. Uh, I actually enlisted, uh, I thought, as an x-ray technician but uh, somehow my recruiter uh, mysteriously uh, missed a digit or two in my enlistment application. So I uh, was going to be trained as an army combat medic. Uh, not that that's a bad thing, but for me, I wanted some, a marketable skill out of the uh, military, um, knowing that at some point in time I would get out and I'd like to have a nice, decent job. Um, and also the fact that my family couldn't send me to college uh, uh, really reinforced the need for me to get a good marketable skill. The book tells about my time in Vietnam uh, as an advisor to Vietnamese, and it tells a story of a sometimes naive, sometimes bored, but always willing young lieutenant and the people I came in contact during my tour in Chan Tan province. My published bio fills in the highlights of my military, educational, and uh, professional life. Harvey? Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Harvey Weiner, and I'm a past national commander of the JWV. Now, like John, I was born and raised poor, but we did have indoor plumbing. I lived in an unheated three-decker in an Irish-Jewish Boston neighborhood. Unlike John, who was educated in a one-room schoolhouse, I had a good education that got me out of the neighborhood. Although I confess, I never learned how to repair a tractor like John can. I was the first person in my family to attend college. Although I was in full scholarship, I joined College Army ROTC because they paid $50 a month and I needed the money. After commissioning, I was, uh, uh, went into military intelligence. I went to Vietnam initially as the province assistance Phoenix coordinator and eventually became the province Phoenix coordinator. There is a book called Phoenix and Birds of Prey in the museum's new Vietnam exhibit, which explains the Phoenix program in detail. Although uh, the program got an unwarranted uh, bad press in the US, uh, North Vietnamese General Giap said that Phoenix was the most effective American program in the entire war. Now, I see beyond, behind you, John, you have a captured Viet Cong flag. Uh, I actually brought two home and I gave one to the museum and uh, I have one here and I'm going to put it up uh, while you're speaking so that uh, we can match. Over to you, John. All right. Um, people have asked, you know, how uh, how this webinar came about. And uh, at the same time that I was finalizing my book, uh, which is entitled A Tour in Chung Tien Province, a U.S. Army Lieutenant with MACV Advisory Team 73 in the Mekong Delta, 1969 and 1970. Unbeknownst to me, my Vietnam hooch mate, Harvey Weiner, uh, who's prominently featured in the book was donating his memorabilia to the uh, National Museum of American Jewish Military History. Harvey's contribution was through the National Vietnam Veterans Committee of the Jewish War Veterans of the USA. 
And the exhibit itself is entitled Jewish Americans in Military Service During Vietnam. Harvey's donation is on display at the National Museum of American Jewish, Milita American Jewish Military History and is mostly from his service in the uh, Chongqing province, although it spans some of his other army activities. Some of Harvey's uh, memorabilia relates directly to events and people covered in my book. And since we have shared so many experiences, uh, I asked Harvey if he would uh, share this webinar with me today. Um, and as we go through, I will ask Harvey, you know, to give his thoughts on uh, and memories on things that happened in Chungkin province and about some of his items that are on display at the museum. Now, people ask me also, well, why did you write this book? Well, first of all, I never thought I would ever write a book, um, let alone get one published. But uh, I was sitting on the stage in the fall of 2017 uh, at the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Museum and Library here in Springfield, Illinois. And this was prior to Ken Burns releasing his Vietnam series uh, that was going to be shown starting the next week. We had four other people on the stage, including my, uh, excluding myself, and we briefly related our experiences during the Vietnam conflict. And it occurred uh, certainly to me during the question and answer period that the audience, um, by virtue of their questions, really had little knowledge or understanding of our involvement in Vietnam. And I certainly wanted to fix that for my children and my grandchildren. So I just started, started writing a book for them. Now, what happened with the book was uh, I finished what I thought was uh, going to be the complete book, and I gave it to several of my friends just to check it for accuracy and, you know, do some edits and whatever it uh, might take. And what they told me was that, boy, this is a pretty good start. Uh, you really need to go in and spend a little bit more time and uh, talk about the things that actually went on on an advisory team in Vietnam. So following their advice, I uh, did that, um, put a manuscript together, uh, sent it off, and five years after our my uh, presentation on stage, I was fortunate enough to have my book published by McFarlane and Company. And the book uh, allows the reader to see, in often in great detail, what life was uh, like on an advisory team, and it includes the camaraderie that we shared amongst one another. Here we see two young soldiers, um, Don um, Blower and Mal Zelifro, both young enlisted soldiers, uh, like so many um, others of their time. But uh, they first met one another in Vietnam and subsequently have become lifelong friends. On our team also, we had uh, civilian advisors as well. Here's we, here we see uh, Norm Olson uh, with his Vietnam counterpart. And uh, I would just mention that when I use the word counterpart, um, that's what we Americans typically call, typically call the American that we were, the Vietnamese that we were dealing with. And um, a little side on uh, Mr. Olson, he was uh, a civilian, but he was actually the number two person in uh, Chongqing province and served as the assistant province senior, senior advisor. What this next picture shows, um, first of all, it identified the gentleman uh, kind of in the middle holding up a glass of uh, beer. I'm sure it's beer. Uh, that's um, Frank Para. Now, Frank um, is interesting in the sense that he was, prior to coming into the Army, he was a ballet danseur. So uh, what this picture is intended to show uh, is how close we actually came with the uh, our, um, our Vietnamese counterparts. Um, they enjoyed being around us and, and certainly that uh, street went both ways. But uh, in any event, um, we had a great uh, 
experience. I mean, all of us in Vietnam, I mean, it fundamentally changes everyone when you go to war. Um, and what I will do as uh, we go through this afternoon is I'll discuss uh, some of the routine things that happen, uh, some of the tragic things that happen, and certainly some of the humorous things that happen during my time in uh, Vietnam. Um, and I wanted the reader just to get a sense for uh, and understand the, the weather, the terrain, the general living conditions uh, in the province, as well as some of the web weapon systems that we used and by all means, the military uh, terminology or jargon that we used, knowing full well that uh, many civilians don't understand uh, military ease, so to speak. But what this picture shows is it shows the terrain um, in, in this particular case, perhaps the weather, uh, obviously taken during the monsoon season. But what I would like you to pick up from this is the flatness of the terrain and just you know, water pretty much all around. Where we were at, uh, we were about uh, one meter above ground, uh, or I'm sorry, above sea level uh, throughout the province. I mean, it was just absolutely as flat as a tabletop. But uh, now when I talk about uh, the level of detail, and I, I mentioned the the jargon, the the terrain and, and weapons and that sort of thing, I went to great lengths to cover these sorts of things in a very detailed uh, glossary and endnotes uh, so that the reader could really find out, you know, what weapon, uh, what capabilities a weapon possessed or what a particular term meant or whatever. So, and I've had uh, a lot of good comments about the, the level of detail on this. And some of the other things that, uh, you know, I talk about are, are just, incredibly subtle. Um, for example, when we were in country, uh, when you saw someone in shiny fatigues, you knew right immediately that they were new in country. Uh, in the book, I also talk about the uh, sights and the smells from uh, Vietnam. And then also uh, the, 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 the demography within um, Chung Tim province, and certainly the topography that, uh, that we showed as well. Here you see a picture of um, then Lieutenant Bob Noonan, and I'm really happy to, to talk about this picture um, because it's part of the detail that I mentioned about uh, removing leeches from uh, one another after crossing uh, through the river or canal. But in this case, Bob Noonan is carrying his radio on his head, very likely picking up uh, some of those nasty little critters that we're talking about. And um, what is so uh, good about or great about this picture is the fact that Lieutenant Bob Noonan went on to become Lieutenant General Bob Newman, Noonan um, and retired from the Army with 30 plus years. I mean, very, very happy uh, that we have him and so many other distinguished members that served on our team. But also um, now jumping back to the, the kind of detail that I was mentioning, talk about monkey bridges. Um, we talk about uh, how in country, everyone was counting days um, until they got out of Vietnam and returned home. I mean, it, it became almost a custom that when you greeted someone, you would ask them, how many days do you have left? And um, it, without fail, everyone knew exactly how many days they had left in uh, in country. And then some of the other things I talk about is some of the, the culture and customs of the Vietnamese people themselves. You know, some of the uh, taboos that they had, which you didn't put your hand on uh, someone's head or you didn't point the bottom of your feet at their face or towards anyone, and their absolute reverence for their elders. Um, and then, to one thing that was kind of hard for me to get over, at least initially, was. Um, the Vietnamese, Vietnamese uh, men, women in particular, they would walk down the street holding hands. I mean, it was just uh, something that was uh, foreign to my Midwestern values. And then also in the book, we talk about the flight home from uh, Vietnam and many other things that we did over there. Uh, and, and what I will say is, uh, if you've not had a chance to read the book, uh, I absolutely guarantee that anyone who served in Vietnam 
uh, can relate to this book. Now, I just told you what the book is. I'm going to tell you what the book is not. Uh, the book is not a military strategy or even tactics um, type of uh, essay, uh, nor is it a political al analysis of the Vietnam conflict. Um, it, it certainly reflects, reflects several uh, combat operations that I went on, uh, but it focuses more on people. And, um, and I'm talking here both Vietnamese and American. Uh, in particular, I just need to mention uh, a Lieutenant An. Uh, Lieutenant An was a company commander of the 987 um, Regional Forest Company. And um, this young man, uh, probably about 24, 25 years old at the time, had been, um, had been wounded several times, uh, had a great company. I mean, it just his men just absolutely revered him. And I was honored to spend a lot of my time with him and uh, became a good friend of his. And as you'll hear me say later on, it's just the regret of not knowing what, uh, what may have happened to him. But I also talk about some of the other uh, soldiers, the uh, interpreters we had, the young soldiers, um, uh, also on uh, in the companies in particular, uh, how they were just amazed at the Americans and uh, uh, we we're pretty much a curiosity to them. But in all, the book is written from the eyes of a, of a 22 year old um, lieutenant. And um, these are things that really happen. These are real life experiences. And as I mentioned, the book dwells mostly at the person to person level, the friendships, but I also talk about my thoughts and observations and the events going on around me. Now, let's start the book. I mean, the book begins uh, with my commissioning in, um, in um, Fort Belvoir in um, 1968. But I also talk, I'll do a little flashback to my, my time getting to that point, how joining the Army, and I mentioned, you know, not getting the, the specialty that I wanted. But I attended uh, officer candidate school because, again, it offered a greater opportunity for me after the military. And what you see here is you see a picture of uh, my mother and I. Uh, she's very proud, uh, and I'm just thankful that this whole ordeal is over. But we're standing at National Airport uh, in Washington, D.C. Subsequently, it's been renamed Reagan uh, National Airport. And... Uh, after I, I got commissioned through OCS, I uh, was assigned to Fort Hood, Texas, and uh, it started out well, but uh, then uh, I, I just knew that I was going to end up in Vietnam. So I volunteered to Vietnam. I attended about three and a half months of Vietnamese language school, uh, and I also attended advisor school um, before I went over there. But the book uh, takes you through that. And then it also talks about my experience of flying um, into Travis Air Force Base, California from uh, Chicago, and, and my subsequent uh, flight and thoughts on my way over to Vietnam. Uh, once we arrived in country, uh, I give my impressions about Vietnam and arriving in Tonsonute Air Force Base, which uh, or Tonsonute Airport it is not an Air Force base, but Tonsonute Airport, uh, which I thought was incredibly primitive. Um, it had uh, inc incredible security running around it uh, and just masses of people. And I'm talking here, civilians uh, and military people just milling about. Uh, after Tonsonute uh, arriving there, I took a bus over to uh, what we fondly called um, Pentagon East, which is the MACV headquarters there in uh, Saigon, where I was uh, in process, uh, given all my uh, necessary papers and filling out, uh, you know, insurance forms and your locator cards and all that other kind of stuff, as well as checking out my my shot record, making sure that was up to date, and then uh, at the end getting my. Uh, final assignment, which was to Chungtian province. And uh, here I, I, I tell a story in the book. I'm going to just digress a little bit here of my first encounter with what I thought was a VC. 
And it happened that I was at um, at the barracks there at uh, Pentagon East, and I went in to uh, relieve myself. And um, I go in and do my business. And as I look around out of the very corner of my eye, I see this figure of a um, person in black pajamas and a one of the conical Vietnam uh, hats or headgear that they wore over there. And I thought, oh my gosh, um, the VC is infiltrated here and I'm dead before I even get started. So I uh, I quickly turned around. I was going to jump on the person, but as it turned out, it was the, actually the cleaning um, lady for the uh, the restroom or the latrine, as the military calls him. But um, I, I just thought that was kind of an interesting little story, and and, I, and those are my true feelings. I really think it was a VC. But as I as I mentioned. I got my uh, my orders to to go to my final destination, which was going to be Chongqing Province. And uh, when I arrived there, landed there at this uh, very primitive airport, and this uh, particular picture here, what it shows, this is of Chongqing Province. Uh, again, I just wanted to show the flatness of the ground. Uh, in this case, the the many rice paddies that were all around the intermittent. Um, streams and the canals. And if you look closely, you'll see what appears to be pock marks uh, within the rice paddy fields themselves, very likely from uh, indirect fire. So, um, but in Vitan, or I'm sorry, in Chungkin province, uh, arrived at the airfield, uh, took a took a, a jeep to, um, to the MACV headquarters compound. And what I found there was, uh, this is a picture of that uh, particular uh, compound, and and I talk about it in pretty good detail within the book uh, about how, um, you know, I guess, for the lack of a better term, modern things were. I mean, as uh, Spartan as the airfield and the road and the, uh, the town uh, of Viton appeared, uh, I thought this uh, compound was uh, incredible. So we had... Uh, Certainly had flat, uh, or I'm sorry, we had hot showers, we had electricity, and uh, though everything was uh, painted green, OD green, um, we had uh, bunkers all around, and uh, all in all, it was not a bad place to spend one year of my life. Harvey? Well, John has given you the uh, good part of uh, Chungtin province, and I'm going to give you some of the bad part of Chungtin province. Uh, it was about two thirds of the size of Rhode Island and was created only in the 1960s. Uh, of the 44 provinces in Vietnam and South Vietnam, uh, Chung Tin uh, was either the first or the second most dangerous province in South Vietnam. Uh, a fact which John says he didn't know about when he was there. Anywhere from 50 to 75 percent of the province was Viet Cong controlled. And the source in this was the uh, Hess reports, the Hamlet evaluation system. You see Chung Tin province, it's in the southern Mekong Delta. If you think of Vietnam as a huge snake, uh, including North Vietnam coming down, uh, Chung Tin province is in the in the rattle of the rattlesnake. Um, and uh, Chung Tin was divided into five, um, five little districts. Uh, Vitan was in the Duke Long districts, and there were small advisory teams in each of the districts. And uh, you couldn't get to each of the districts in many situations by road because it was Viet Cong controlled. So you had to go by chopper uh, to at least Ken Hung and Ken Long uh, and probably Long B as well. Um, the uh, um, Chung Tin also contained on uh, the left in Ken Long the infamous uh, Yumin Forest, which was very famous in the uh, for a huge battle in the French Indochina War, not Vietnam Dan Phu, but other battles. 
Uh, and uh, this province in South Vietnam was the province that no one, either Americans or Vietnamese, wanted to be at. So you can imagine the difficulty Americans had getting interpreters on the one hand, and on the other, the quality of the uh, Vietnamese compared to people in Canto and Saigon that ended up in Vietnam. In, in, in Vitan and in Chungton in general. Uh, John? When I got in country, my assignment was actually called the province engineer advisor. And, and again, I was commissioned as an engineer officer uh, through OCS. But when I and arrived at Vit uh, Vitan, there were just literally no engineer activities. I mean, there was no US uh, engineer presence in the, in the uh, Mekong, except for small detachments that went around mostly to fix um, airfields and that sort of thing. So I was left with, uh, well, uh, I needed to do something to make time go faster. So I volunteered for a lot of things, including going on uh, combat operations with mostly uh, the regional uh, forces soldiers and uh, the popular forces soldiers, which were not the Vietnamese regular army, but rather uh, roughly equivalent to uh, the National Guard and then the PF probably to a militia. But uh, I did do some engineering activities. As you see here, uh, I am in the process of wiring a jettisoned uh, helicopter rocket pod for destruction. Um, and standing with me is uh, Harvey and my other uh, hooch mate, Gene Griffiths. Uh, but anyway, uh, this is one of the things that I did uh, with my engineer training, as well as uh, I did have to go down to Ken Long and repair a uh, airfield that had been, uh, had a mortar round right through the center of it so no one could land or go anywhere. So I got that taken care of. Recovered a um, sunken ferry, a Vietnamese uh, sappers had dropped a old uh, bridge pier on the ferry that had taken its place. And so my mission was to go down and recover that. Uh, also helped the Vietnamese uh, build an outpost. And, and in addition to blowing up uh, jettison rocket pods, I also uh, did kind of low-grade EOD work, uh, explosive ordnance disposal work, blowing up uh, mortar rounds that had landed in the wrong places or improper places and disposing of old uh, ammunition and that sort of thing. So I, I did my my best to, uh, to stay busy uh, with those things. And then in addition, some of the other things that I did volunteer for is I... Uh, was the manager of an assistance in kind fund, which provided US funds to the Vietnamese so that we could kind of stimulate their economy and, and help them out. Uh, the good part of that was it allowed me to go to uh, Saigon uh, about every six weeks. Uh, I also volunteered to fly on medevacs um, to recover uh, Vietnamese wounded where there was no American present and uh, I would act as the interpreter. And, and the short story there is that the helicopter crews uh, would not go anywhere where they did not uh, feel safe. And so therefore, um, I would have to go and I guess assure their, their safety and communicate with the, the ground element. And uh, uh, we did that quite a bit. And uh, that was a pretty rewarding thing. And, and then lastly, I did some translations for um, You've heard Agent Orange reluctantly speak about that, but uh, um, I would have to translate uh, the Vietnamese request for defoliation um, because that would have to also go through American channels. So between me and my interpreter, uh, we got that, uh, that mission accomplished as well. And then when I wasn't doing all of those things, and it sounds like a lot, I was uh, conserving my energy. And um, as you can see here, and Harvey actually took this picture, um, I, uh, I managed to log some pretty serious uh, sleep hours in, uh, in Vietnam. But um, 
now let me just kind of jump into uh, the, the makeup of our team, our advisory team. Uh, as I mentioned before, we did have uh, some civilian advisors uh, as well as the military. And we had people of all different ages. If you recall, uh, the, one of the first pictures you saw of uh, the two young enlisted uh, people, uh, Mal Zellifro and Don Blower. Uh, Mal, although he looked like he was about 14, was really 18. And uh, we had people as young as him and uh, probably in their 50s that were serving on the advisory team. Um, in addition to that, they're from different backgrounds. And what I mean by that is uh, as far as some were farmers, some had you know, been drafted, going to school, um, and some had uh, you know, it, it just dropped out of high school. So, I mean, we had different levels of education as well. I mean, they're from Harvey being a law school graduate to, to the high school dropout. They were all on our advisory team. And really the best thing about it was that we all got along incredibly well. And Mike mentioned also in the introduction about how Harvey was the first Jewish person I had ever met. Um, there were actually two um, people of Jewish faith in Chungtin province while I was there. Uh, Harvey was one, Al Miller was another. Al sadly passed away in about 2007. But uh, we all, again, we all had a mission to accomplish uh, and we, you know, work together to get it accomplished. And, uh, and it was really, really a wonderful thing. And to what I, I, I guess I have to say this as well, is that uh, in the Army at that time, I mean, the Army was going through a lot of, uh, a lot of troubles, let's say it that way. And uh, they had fraggings uh, in some of the American units. Well, again, we didn't have any of that, despite the fact that we had uh, draftees, um, again, some non-high school um, diplomas, uh, but we had nothing of, of the sort of uh, discontent that was being experienced at that time uh, in some American units uh, throughout Vietnam. And uh, if I can bring the picture up now that shows, uh, we've got a picture showing a couple of our guys together, if Mike can find out. Uh, I'll mention this one. This is this is actually Harvey, and uh, this is very appropriate attire for uh, during and after a mortar attack. And uh, in addition to being my hooch mate, Harvey was also my bunker commander. So I think he probably got command time for, for those uh, six or so times we were, we were mortared there on the compound. We've, 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 got, uh, we've got another picture uh, coming up that shows just a couple of our, uh, of, of our guys. Um, on the extreme, what you would see as the right, we have an Air Force guy. Uh, we've, got, uh, uh, we've got a career um, soldier NCO to his left. It's uh, Bill Haley. Uh, you read a lot about Bill Haley in my book. I just thought the world of him. Uh, next to Bill, to his uh, to his right, you have uh, um, uh, to his right. That is, you have uh, uh, Ralph Howard. Ralph was a um, observation pilot uh, flying these low and slow O1 uh, airplanes, and uh, Ralph and and I did some rather interesting things together. And uh, to Ralph's right, you see uh, Jim Vagansky. Jim was also another O-1 uh, um, airplane pilot. Uh, and those guys, what they did, their mission was to fly over the battlefield or over the, the, the skies. And uh, they typically have a Vietnamese observer in the back and they would be calling in artillery missions and providing radio relay and kind of giving us on the ground an idea of what's going on. You know, don't go here. You got bad guys coming at you that way or whatever. And then to uh, Jim's uh, immediate right, you've got Jim Yeagers. Uh, Jim actually um, left Vietnam uh, in a couple of days after I got there. 
But uh, from all the stories I heard, Jim was one heck of a, a soldier, and uh, Jim currently lives down in uh, down in Missouri. But talk about all those great things and great people. You know, uh, some of the other things that we had on the uh, MACV compound, we had. Um, uh, I guess aside from being homesick, uh, which I think was a kind of a normal thing for most of us, uh, the the compound in Deton, we had, I mentioned the great mess hall. We also had uh, regular mail. Every night we had movies. Uh, we had a couple of folks. Uh, I know this is one of Harvey's big things. Uh, he and Gene would play tennis over the noontime. Um, they had volleyball in the evening. We had a small PX. And then of course we had a small club that, uh, uh, you know, was the, was the uh, locale for our uh, arrivals and new arrivals, our hail and farewell, the people coming into country, people leaving country, and then also our promotion ceremonies. And uh, all in all, the compound itself was, was really great. Um, and I say that uh, knowing full well that on our advisory team, we had folks, as Harvey mentioned earlier, uh, in at the different district uh, headquarters. And these were typically five-man teams that were living uh, with the Vietnamese. I mean, they didn't have the luxury of, uh, of a compound or a running water or anything else like that. They were, they were immersed in, uh, in the Vietnamese uh, way of life. And uh, we had those five district headquarters. And then we also had, uh, during my time there, about uh, five different MAT teams. And MAT is Mobile uh, uh, Advisory Team. Uh, again, about five men members that they lived in incredibly austere conditions. And uh, it was, it was uh, something I'm glad I did not end up doing. So again, uh, that's kind of a rundown of the of the compounds and some of the things we had. Uh, and then one of the things that I, I did want to mention too is that we did interact a lot with the Vietnamese and on civic type of projects, building schools, fix uh, building or fixing schools, uh, providing supplies to orphanages. And one of the most important things that we did was uh, was to uh, medevac. Uh, civilians, Vietnamese civilians, uh, after some sort of uh, medical emergency, uh, most of which were either uh, childbirth or uh, ex stepping on a landmine or a lot of people with cooking uh, fires flaring up and that sort of thing. So we, uh, we did a lot of that. So Harvey, I'll turn it back to you for a while. The photo that John showed you uh, shows me after a mortar attack, and if an attack begins uh, when you are asleep, uh, you grab your, your boots are right by your bunk, you grab your rifle, your helmet, your flak jacket, you jump in your boots, and you dive into the bunker. Pants can wait for a later time. Um, just to follow up on the diversity of the people on our small team. It really didn't matter if you're in our province, if you were Jewish or Gentile, black or white, Democrat or Republican, gay or straight, rural or urban, male or female. There are only three things that really mattered to each other. One was, could you do your job? Two was, did you have my back when bad things happened, and three, were you a jerk or not? If you passed all those three, you were fine. And that's all that really mattered. Everything else that I mentioned on diversity really was irrelevant. Uh, the advisors, us to the Vietnamese, were a diverse team of specialists who each had different training and a different job on the team. The advisors each had a different Vietnamese counterpart that we had to advise, relate to, and mesh with in diverse ways. And almost all of us only had a year to do it, to get their confidence, to know what the heck is going on. 
Now, an exception to our team not training together is that I went through infantry officers basic training at Fort Benning, Georgia, with three eventual team members, Steve Davis, Bill Smith, and the ballet dancer, Frank Perra. And that's, that's another story. We were all in the same company at Fort Benning, but not the same platoon or barracks. So I really didn't know any of them at Fort Benning and only learned that we trained together when we got to Vietnam. John? Well, I want to talk about uh, some significant events that I mentioned in the book. Um, one of the first was uh, an August uh, ambush of two of our fellow advisors, and these two individuals were on a MAP team who were uh, ambushed and subsequently killed as they were in a uh, sampan heading from their location to Viton for supplies. Um, it, it, unfortunately, things like that happened, but uh, that happened on MAP 54, who uh, about two or three weeks later was to lose a third uh, individual during a combat operation that uh, that I went on. And that was um, on the, the first weekend in September. And that's also the title of the book. And uh, during that combat operation, we lost about 15 uh, killed in action, probably double that number uh, wounded. And of that 15, one of which was that uh, officer off of Matt Team 54 uh, by the name of Steve Young. Uh, Steve had only gotten in country within the past uh, week or two, so he hadn't been there very long. Uh, also, one of the things that uh, is mentioned in the book, and I'm going to let Harvey talk about this in a little bit more detail, was a mine explosion that happened on uh, February 20th of 1970. Um, again, I'll let Harvey talk about that. Uh, you saw Harvey's uh, apparel for the uh, mortar attack. Uh, we probably had, as I mentioned, about uh, half a dozen of those while I was in country. And um, th again, I, that, I call that certainly a significant event. Another significant event for me was the ability, uh, because of my uh, monitoring the assistance in kind fund, was having to go to Saigon about every six weeks. Uh, on my very first trip to Saigon, um, I I couldn't have found my way around Saigon uh, you know, if I was there a month, but I was fortunate to have Harvey go with me. And uh, on that particular trip, we went to Saigon. He showed me, you know, the stopping points and things like that. But significant for me was the fact that uh, for the first time in my life, um, I had a filet mignon at the top of the Continental Hotel. Um, I couldn't even pronounce uh, Flay Mignon before I met Harvey, but uh, Harvey introduced that to me and it was a, just a wonderful experience. Um, some of the other significant events were, were um, in May of 1970. In May of 1970, um, the um, incursion or invasion, I, I call it incursion, I guess the Americans didn't want to use the word invasion, but the incursion to, into Cambodia uh, occurred. And certainly that was something that for the Vietnamese just puts their morale kind of off the charts. Now, none of the local folks that we were dealing with, nor any of the American advisors went there, but uh, the, the and we had an element of the Arvin 21st Division that was located there in Viton. They did, and when they came back again, they were just on top of the world. They captured so much stuff. So, uh, aside from you know, the, what I call significant events, there's so many routine things too. Um, but I do talk about uh, you know the the holiday period in particular. I mean the 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 loneliness and sadness that uh, I think any soldier soldier since you know time immemorial. Uh, being away from home, it's just uh, it's just a difficult time of the year, and um, I mentioned I mentioned that in the book, uh, you know, quite a bit. And then last day, a significant event, I would say, and I told you that we had um, promotions and uh, going away and and arrivals, uh, sorts of things in our club. Uh, here you'll see a picture coming up of Harvey uh, as he's standing there 
next to our province senior advisor, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Tom Lavasser, uh, getting the traditional going away gift from the Americans. Now, uh, those gifts don't compare to anything that the uh, Vietnamese uh, presented him when he left. But uh, again, it was a, a token of, of his great service over the 12 month period that he was there. Harvey. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, John. Um, let me talk about two of the uh, three incidents that uh, uh, it's in John's book and that were uh, really the two of the three most significant incidents that during my time there. Uh, one was the R. Dunaway ambush. Uh, Lieutenant Bob Dunaway was from Delaware and Sergeant uh, Howard R. the medic uh, was the medic on MAT Team 54. That being on MAT Team 54 was probably the most dangerous job in Vietnam. That, that person, five person team advised a South Vietnamese equivalent and they were in the jungle and in the, and in the uh, VC territory almost all the time. Uh, both uh, Lieutenant Dunaway and uh, Sergeant Ard were killed in an ambush. And uh, I inventoried uh, uh, Bob Dunaway's uh, effects and wrote a letter uh, of condolence to his widow, one of the most difficult things I ever have ever done. But I, uh, there was a ceremony afterwards uh, at the uh, province compound, a memorial service, and uh, uh, I took photos of them and there was a brochure from them. Uh, and they are part of the museum exhibit, at least copies, a part of the museum exhibit on Vietnam. Uh, Mike, do you want to show the uh, memorial service set up the photo? Now, several years ago, uh, I also gave the originals to the children and grandchildren of Doc Ard, as well as a short story of my dealings with him. And there's the memorial service. Um, for a few years after I gave that to uh, his children and grandchildren, uh, I received many, many Christmas cards from them from South Carolina. And they contacted us only because John had set up a Facebook page for our team. Um, the second major incident that is really covered well in John's book is the uh, road mine bombing. Uh, and I was involved in that. Uh, and there are some horrific pictures on there. Uh, in a nutshell, um, what happened was um, a weapons cache uh, was discovered and two Jeeps went out to view that weapons cache. One Jeep was filled with the Vietnamese, the province chief, my counterpart, and several others. The other Jeep was uh, I was in it, uh, my interpreter, my assistant, my sergeant, and we were leading the way. I, uh, there was apparently a left turn, and there's dispute as to why this happened, and my driver missed that left turn. Um, but the, the Vietnamese in the Jeep behind me took that left turn, uh, flipped us a bird as they went down there, we had to back up and follow them, but not five minutes when they got onto that road, uh, they hit a landmine and it killed four of them and wounded everyone else except the province chief. Um, it, they happened to be somebody from the defense department in Washington with us and he took many of these pictures. Um, I. Uh, always carried with me a piece, not carried with me, but I took a piece of shrapnel uh, from that and kept it with me for, uh, for uh, 40, 50 years. And it's now in the, uh, in my shadow box in the museum exhibit. Um, I have a really, I made a full report of this to the museum about this incident and its unusual aftermath. And it's in online if you want to uh, see that as well. Uh, John? 
I hope everyone understood what um, Harvey was saying there. Is it, you know, let me put it a different way. Had Harvey's Jeep uh, made that left turn, knowing that's the way they were supposed to go, uh, in all likelihood, we would not have Harvey here today. I mean, it, it's just one of the many uh, quirks that, that seem to happen in wartime. Um, you know, who, who gets to who gets to survive and who doesn't. But anyway, um, some of the, one of the things I do talk a lot about, uh, as I said, throughout the book is just interactions with uh, with individuals. And uh, I, I was really, really lucky, uh, though I volunteered to have the Vietnamese language training and included in that was cultural training, which uh, kind of let me know the things that uh, that I needed to do and, and for that part not to do. And uh, I, it really helped me. It, it got to the point where uh, towards the end of my tour, I didn't need a, an interpreter um, because, uh, you know, when you are talking with the common soldiers, and that's why I love to talk to the most, um, it, it's just about, you know, where are you from? How old? How old are you? Uh, are you married? Do you have children? Um, that sort of thing. And I was certainly able to converse with them at, at that level, uh, and, and the Vietnamese children as well. And um, what I found from both the soldiers, but especially from the children, is they were very curious uh, about us as Americans. I mean, we were almost a novelty to them. And of course, uh, again, in our particular remote province, there weren't a whole lot of us running around. So um, we were we were certainly a curiosity to them. But during the year that I was there, I mean, uh, in particular, formed very, very deep bonds with uh, with our counterparts. Um, and as I said before, uh, Lieutenant An uh, was was the one that I was closest to. I mean, he was he was a company commander of a of an infantry company uh, RF, uh, company. And, um, he was an incredible warrior. Just, uh, think the world of him even to this day. One of the things that I did have to do though, and I, I should mention this is that I did deal with the public works chief there in Viton. Um, although his educational level just far out surpassed mine. I mean, um, I was trained as a combat engineer. He was trained as as a professional engineer. So um, about all I did with him was uh, uh, share his company and uh, on at least one occasion drink his cognac. So uh, that was my interaction with uh, the public works chief. Harvey? Yes, I, I really became close friends with my Vietnamese counterparts. And this can be really evidenced by, in part by the gifts that they and my interpreter gave me that are really part of the museum exhibit. Uh, my counterpart gave me a lacquered uh, landscape painting, and my interpreter, Ong Kim Ba, gave me uh, two small vases. Uh, they also gave me a phenomenal going away party, which, to be frank with you, I don't remember at all, but I have many photos of it, and, and none of those photos really refresh my recollection. However, to my regret, and I think this is true of veterans of Afghanistan, as well as who were advisors, I did not keep in contact with them when I returned stateside. And I later learned from two of Chung Tin's escapees after Vietnam fell, who happened by a way, escaped and ended up in the greater Boston area, I found out that my main counterpart was killed in a horrible way uh, after the North took over, and my interpreter's whereabouts are unknown. I deeply regret this, that I have no, and I will do so until my dying day. John? Well, one thing that I should mention is that, and it's in the book as well, is that uh, uh, our role as advisors was, was not to command. Ours was not to come in and push the Vietnamese aside and say, let it, let me show you how to do this. Our mission was to go in and, uh, and assist them, assist them in, in their tactics, uh, in Harvey's case, assist them in developing, you know, a, a profile for Viet Cong infrastructure, that sort of thing. So, um, it was a very, very, uh, 
um, narrow uh, path that we had to walk down. I mean, you just did not want to see uh, seem as if you were commanding because that would cause uh, the person in command to lose space. And that was something that was very, very important to them. So, you know, in a, in a nutshell, our role was just to, to train our Vietnamese counterparts to effectively prosecute the war uh, against communism and, and hopefully um, that they could build a, a democratic country. Um, unfortunately, we kind of know how that turned out. But uh, in the field, some of the things that, uh, that we did or that I did was uh, um, as an American, we were responsible for certain elements of U.S. support. And what you see here is a medevac helicopter uh, coming out of the 82nd Air Ambulance Company that uh, was called in by an American advisor um, because again, the, uh, the dust off crews would not come in unless they had an American on the ground or someone talking to the ground. But uh, here they're loading uh, some of their wounded comrades onto that helicopter. And this was one of the many missions uh, that we showed. Uh, the other thing that uh, we did was um, to call in for example, the, the lift helicopters. Lift helicopters would be the ones that would come in and, and bring us into a landing zone or to pick us up from a landing zone. Uh, we also called in helicopter gunships. And then as I mentioned before with the Army 01 uh, bird dog pilots, here you have a picture of uh, a very good friend of ours, uh, Jug Eastman. Uh, Jug was, uh, was an Air Force pilot, tried not to hold that too much against him. But here you uh, have a picture of him in his revetment uh, with his uh, four uh, rockets on each side of his wings. And uh, Jug was, uh, was instrumental in that, um, what I call that uh, first weekend in September part of the book. Uh, he did a lot of great things. Harvey? Yeah, we, we provided support and assets to the Vietnamese, as John said. But I think in retrospect, our most important role was to form friendships and positive relationships with the Vietnamese, and I think we did that. And unlike John, I didn't have significant Vietnamese language training. I think I had a couple of weeks at Fort Holabird, Maryland, and then only because we pressured the brass uh, to give us a short course. But no matter how much Vietnamese uh, language training I would have received, it probably would have been for naught, because Vietnamese is a tonal language and I'm tone deaf. So at least uh, the Vietnamese alphabet uh, is, is the Latin alphabet, so I could at least read it. John? Uh, lastly, I want to give some impressions of, uh, of uh, Vietnam or certainly Chung Tien province in, uh, that I express in the book. Uh, it, it was certainly a third world and, and primitive country. Um, here you have a picture of uh, some these are, uh, you know, these are probably uh, middle to high income uh, family homes in the uh, rural Chongtian province. But it just shows that they're made out of uh, thatch and all have bare floors. And uh, the interesting thing about those hooches, we call them hooches out in the, on the countryside as well. But uh, they all had a, a dug um, bunker inside there. So they would dig a bunker and, you know, in some fashion form a, um, a, uh, like almost like an igloo over the top of it where the family could escape to, you know, in the event of bombing or, um, you know, any sort of, uh, danger. And, uh, it was actually on the top of one of those bunkers that I slept on, uh, on that, uh, first weekend in September. But, uh, Again, it was just very, very austere conditions for the people. And uh, we, uh, what, what, what I found more than anything is that um, dealing with the people in the countryside more than anything else, they were merely trying to, you know, ride the fence between the Vietnamese government and the Viet Cong. Uh, all they wanted to do was to be left alone and uh, just kind of eke out an existence as best they could, and probably as they had done for hundreds of years uh, prior to us going there. What, uh, 
what I what I found interesting was uh, I mentioned earlier about the children. Uh, I think most every child I saw um, had had a, had a broad smile on their face, and I don't know if this was the novelty of an American in their presence, or um, they just felt that that's what they needed to do, but. Uh, I always thought that those children were the, the future of, of that country, and that's really what we were there for. Um, my, my last observation was about uh, impression about Vietnam is that throughout the book, I, I, I mentioned the word, I couldn't believe this. I, I'm talking to the issue of a dichotomy, a, a dichotomy of what Harvey and I were living through versus what was going on um, that I was getting through my hometown newspaper uh, in Geneseo, Illinois. Um, everything was happy. People were getting married, having children. Uh, State Fair was uh, in town, um, those kinds of things. So again, uh, the dichotomy between what we were doing and what we were hearing. And by the same token, going up to Saigon, um, I probably made... Oh, a half a dozen trips up to Saigon, and it, it was just, it was a different world from what, again, Harvey and I were, were living through, and uh, it was just sometimes hard to come to grips with. Harvey? Yes, I remember in the immediate aftermath of the 1970 Jeep road bombing, uh, being on my knees right there uh, and looking on either side of the road at the rice farmers. They were planting and harvesting rice as if nothing had happened. And there were bodies everywhere. And I had a deja vu of the final scene of the Japanese movie, The Seven Samurai, where something similar occurs. Uh, so my impression is events, even major events like wars, come and go over the centuries in Vietnam. But rice farming, and the rice farmers are a constant. John? Yeah. Uh, in the book, I mentioned um, that uh, I was never afraid. And I don't know exactly how that sounds, but uh, um, perhaps I was uh, too young, too immature, too naive to be afraid, but I was never afraid. And I, I totally enjoyed my time with the Vietnamese uh, and and. The driving thing for me was I, uh, perhaps at that young age, uh, appreciated the fact that they had hopes and aspirations for themselves, for their families and their loved ones, just as we did. And uh, it, 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 the biggest regret that I think that most um, Vietnam advisors have, and I can't speak to advisors of other wars, have is what happened to our counterparts after we left. Um, they were, what I saw were brave soldiers. They served patriotically. They had a great sense of humor, as I mentioned, and they were stoic. And once we left Vietnam, you know, what happened to them? And this is kind of indicative of that. I mean, here we have um, Captain Romero, who is an intelligence officer after Harvey, uh, he's got his arm around uh, to his right, um, Kang. Kang. Uh, he was an interpreter, and uh, to his left is An, who was an interpreter. Uh, the good news is we do know what happened to Kang and An. Uh, Kang lives in um, in the Boston area, and An lives in the Houston area. Uh, so, as I said uh, at several of our reunions, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, these are our legacy, those that were able to get to this country uh, and survive and thrive, and their children are the legacy of what we did in Vietnam. And um, I'm really, I'm really happy for that. Harvey? Yeah, to my surprise, like John, I really was never afraid either. Uh, but I was alert 24-7 because there were no front lines and the enemy could be and was anyone. Over 50 years later, the slightest sound still awakens me, and I awake on full alert. I don't need any caffeine. However, I was afraid of something in Vietnam. I was afraid of embarrassing myself 
on not doing my job well. And for example, when jumping out of helicopters, you're about a few feet off the ground with rifle and full gear, I was afraid that I would fall face forward or get stuck in the mud and embarrass myself. I didn't care if the landing zone was a hot landing zone or not. I just didn't want to uh, embarrass myself. And do I regret going to Vietnam? I'm asked that question a lot. Well, uh, on the one hand, I made some extraordinary lifelong friendships, both with uh, Americans and with Vietnamese. I had some amazing experiences, uh, and uh, I am proud that as an American Jew, I went to Vietnam and fought and belied the notion that Jews do not serve their country in war. There are no friendships like war buddies because they alone understand. I consider that I did my job well, but on the other hand, I did get cancer from Agent Orange. I experienced some really bad stuff. And in retrospect, I now appreciate the angst of my wife and the angst of my parents that my absence caused. There was little communication. They just didn't know. So weighing it, to paraphrase W.C. Fields, famous fictional epitaph, all things considered, I'd rather have been in Philadelphia. John? The, the last thing that uh, we'd like to talk about today, and I know it's been a long um, presentation thus far, but uh, I just talk, like to talk a little bit about uh, reunions. We've... Um, We've had uh, seven reunions so far. We've got our eighth, and I'm talking a team reunion, uh, strictly for those individuals that were assigned to Chungtin province. Uh, reunions are cathartic. I mean, uh, they uh, help the veterans come and heal. And uh, what you see on the screen right now is a picture of our very first uh, reunion booklet, which was held in, uh, uh, St. Louis, as you can see, but it, at those reunions, it allows uh, the veterans to talk and to share some of their kind, you know, their common experiences. Certainly, uh, it lets their spouse see the things that their loved one went through and perhaps better understand, uh, you know, their experiences and sometimes uh, our reluctance to talk about it. So uh, I just strongly encourage anyone out there that may belong to a, 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 a unit, an army or military, uh, air force, whatever, just get yourselves uh, together on a reunion because it's really uh, not beneficial just for you, but it's for everyone that's around you. All right. Yeah, uh, although he doesn't admit it, John spent decades, decades finding team members and getting them together, including those who were not there uh, the year John and I were there. And in these reunions, uh, we have renewed and strengthened old friendships and made new ones. I have seen John meet for the first time since the incident, someone who was shot six times and whom John rescued under fire from a rice paddy, for which I think John should have got the Silver Star, but he didn't. Uh, I've met my trusty assistant after over 50 years of separation. Americans from all walks of life bonded because of a common experience in Vietnam. Like Israel, if everyone in America had a couple of years of national service, not necessarily military service, I think America would be a less fractious place. The reunions attest to this. After all, how could an Eastern, urban, overeducated Jewish liberal like myself be invited to the following events? Guest of honor at the 50th annual Watson, Arkansas fish fry, or be invited to shoot an assault rifle the descendant of our beloved M16 in the cornfields of central Illinois. Thank you, John, Mike. I think that wraps it up uh, for me. Um, Mike, you wanna take over? Yeah, so I, I was wondering, I think maybe Harvey just referenced it. I, I wonder if you could talk about a, 
for a section of the book you write in your uh, first week in the September chapter where you talk about combat with the VC, all you do to help uh, a wounded officer you were with. And then the part I wanted to address is you get back to the hooch and you're dealing with a lot and Harvey is there to talk about it. I, I, I do talk a little bit about it in the book and, and it was helpful for me. I mean, uh, I had been in country at that point for about six weeks. So uh, I was, this was my first, it wasn't my first operation, but it was my first serious operation. One where we took some, uh, a lot of casualties. And uh, as, as we left, as I left that um, battle area, uh, picked up by helicopter. I, I describe myself as being in a zombie-like state. I think that pretty well uh, describes things. And and I I, uh, I, I had a, a great breakfast. Remember that. I uh, took a shower, went to sleep, and I, I probably slept for ten hours or more. And then I woke up that evening, uh, and Harvey was there, of course. And then we talked about it. And Harvey's talking about it just it, it it allowed those demons to escape from me and uh i i i i really haven't been traumatized by that i mean i i haven't suffered ptsd or or some of the other uh maladies that uh that uh, vietnam's veterans face but uh harvey's presence really helped me that evening and uh i i do talk about that in the book you know, I can add that after I went through that road, the Jeep road bombing, I came, I came back to the uh, hooch and I talked it through with John and our other uh, hooch mate, uh, Gene Griffiths. And I think that helped me. That really helped me. Uh, and the point is that you're, you're talking these things through with your war buddies helps extraordinary. And it's one of the main uh, benefits of uh, our reunions. We talk about uh, our experiences to each other because each of us understands, whereas our friends and family, as much as they try, they really don't understand. Did writing the book have a similar effect, John? Was that, was that, uh, did that change your perception of your experiences or, or affect you in any way? It, it it really didn't. I I mean I've I'm very accepting of things, and you know by this time, fifty some years later, I mean I it I think I I more than anything the reunions helped. So I, I guess that, that experience um, coming in front of the book writing uh, kind of took all the the steam out of that for me. So uh, I guess what was uh, interesting to me was just remembering all the the funny times i mean the times of falling into a uh, into a crater you know filled with water with a radio on your back or slipping as you're trying to get away from a hand grenade that you've just thrown or something like that um so uh, again i the the book writing the book just really didn't change things any uh, several questions in the q a uh Asking if either of you have been back to Vietnam. Have either of you guys returned? I have not. I have not either. Okay, any we, desire to? Uh, for me, um, we've had several of our um, teammates that have attended the reunions that have uh, gone to uh, to um, Chung Tien province. Uh, one, the last one, I believe, is in 2017. Uh, uh, living down in San Antonio, but uh, it, it it sounds as if the uh, the Vietnamese government has done everything in their power to erase every aspect of the American presence there. And, you know, I, if someone told me with certainty that they could reunite me with Lieutenant An, uh, I'd be on the next flight to uh, Saigon or Ho Chi Minh City now. Uh, it, it might interest you to know that uh, the communist government in South Vietnam in what was formerly Chung Tin province has set up a military museum uh, called the Chung Tin Museum, Military Museum. And it could be, John, that you and I are in there. <laughs>
Uh, here's a question from uh, an anonymous question. In your circle, how many were drafted versus voluntarily signed up? Uh, in in our group, I would. Well, I think they probably, yeah, both in your group and also, I guess, just your friends from home. Oh, my. That's, that's a very, very difficult question. I would say that probably we had, again, we, we're talking about a team of um, 40 or 50 soldiers. And I would have to say that that most of them were uh, a senior rank. I mean, um, because the, the army and their infinite wisdom wanted, you know, experienced people uh, training the Vietnamese. So our support people in particular were uh, were uh, the younger enlisted ones. And I would guess that we probably had in the neighborhood of, of 20, 25 of them on our compound. And I'm just going to throw a wild guess out here that maybe half were um, drafted and the other half volunteered. I mean, that's just my absolute guess. Uh, I uh, That's my guess as well. But I don't have any real information on that. It would just be a guess. Uh, Larry Stern asked, was participation, was participation in the MAT teams embedded in D.C. territory voluntary? No. Absolutely not. They they were trained, but but um, it was not it was not a voluntary thing. I mean, you were you were assigned there, and uh, I well, Harvey mentioned earlier our uh, friend uh, um, Frank Para, who was the one holding the beer in the midst of the Vietnamese, and who was also the uh, the the ballet person. Uh, Dan Sewer, but uh, Frank was actually on Matt Team 54 for an entire year, and uh, you know, he survived. So, I mean, but the majority of our casualties on our team were at that during the time that we were there, Harvey and I uh, were from the Matt teams, so and it was not voluntary. And from Matt's Team 54, which was considered the unlucky Matt's team, right. Uh, Mark Depew asked, when working with the Vietnamese, did you typically speak their language? Did they know English? You, you've addressed the language skills of some, but were there a lot of English speakers amongst the Vietnamese? Yes, yes. Um, a lot of the officers were um, uh, able to speak Vietnamese. And in particular, again, I'll talk to Lieutenant An, who is kind of typical of those that I served with. Um, between his broken English and my broken Vietnamese, I mean, we could we could, we got along really well without an interpreter. I mean, to the point where we would, you know, go out and uh, have a few beers, uh, you know, on on slow days. But uh, uh, the officers, yes, they were were reasonably good. I mean, below that or anywhere else, no, not at all. And uh, if you had officers that came from um, the military school. Uh, Delot. I mean, and we had a couple of them running around. They were they were good as well as far as English goes. So, um, I'd, I'd say in my experience of the ones that I dealt with, probably a, a third of the officers that I dealt with could speak uh, English reasonably well. Uh, Larry Stern asked, uh, since the war, have you ever met former VC or North Vietnamese soldiers? Yet any, any interaction with them in more recent years? Uh, yeah, I, I'll, I'll take that one first and then flip it to Harvey. Uh, it just happened that when I was going to the uh, Army War College Fellowship at Tufts, which is in Medford, uh, Mass., that uh, one of my classmates was a uh, colonel at that time in the uh, Vietnamese Army who had been a captain in the North, Viet Army, North Vietnamese Army uh, during the time we were uh, at war. So. He is the only one, uh, North Vietnamese or VC. VC, I, 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 they were, you know, again, I talk about levels of, of training and skill. The, the VC were incredibly good tacticians and uh, with a lot of things, but they weren't really well educated for the most part. So I haven't seen or heard of any of them. Harvey? I, I haven't uh, met any uh, VC or... Uh or XVC or uh, NVA, uh, North Vietnamese, 
since coming back to the States. But I do remind you that you met many VC and former VC uh, when you were in uh, Chungtin province and uh, your barber was ex-VC, uh, as were uh, several people that we uh, had rallied to the uh, Vietnamese, uh, the again, the, the uh, South Vietnamese cause. So we knew a lot of VC then, our ex-VC. How challenging was the, the part of your work? Were you trying to identify and uh, uh, deal with the VC when and while you're trying to be uh, work closely and, and develop friendship with the uh, Vietnamese and, and not necessarily knowing who might be VC? You just had to take everything at face value. I mean, as long as they didn't shoot at you, you tried to treat them halfway well, you know. Once the once you see the muscle flash, then uh, then you know then they've established themselves. I I t took over an, a, a organization uh, that was uh, was going well. I I think I did some things to improve it, but it was a going concern when I took it over. I didn't have to initiate much. It was very it was successful at the time I took over, and I think it was successful at the time I left it. So. Uh, it was, I think it was easier for me. I assume that some of the Americans took over situations which were not uh, going concerns, and that must have been very difficult for them. Uh, let's finish up with one from, uh, from Bob Jacobs, who uh, was uh, chair of Vietnam Veterans Committee of Jewish War Veterans and an important person in getting the, uh, the exhibit up here in the museum. He asked, uh, did results of the spring incursion of Cambodia have any direct effects in your area? Can you come down? Uh, once again, I talk a little bit about that in the book. Uh, uh, the thing that uh, I say is that uh, when the unit or element of the Arvin 21st Division, which was stationed in Viton, which is the same town that our MACV compound was in, when they returned from Cambodia, I mean, they were just literally sky high. Their morale was soaring. I mean, if you remember that, um, that uh, operation, um, they captured a lot of supplies, a, uh, uh, a lot of weapons. They, they destroyed a bunch of rice supplies. I mean, it was just an incredibly successful mission. And um, as, as a result, if, if you can see the picture of Ho Chi Minh that I have over my right shoulder, you know, it's kind of hard to see, but that actually came out of, the, uh, out of Cambodia. Uh, it was captured by... Uh, a soldier in the 21st Division that gave it to Lieutenant Ahn, who in turn gave it to me. So again, uh, that was a, uh, an incredibly great operation uh, for the Vietnamese. Although, again, I have to mention that we did not have any of our um, MACV advisory team, 73 advisors, with any of those uh, soldiers that went in. Okay, so you guys have, uh, you want to give any last word? Before we uh, sign off, I, I would just like to say again, thanks to uh, to Mike and certainly to the uh, National Museum of American Jewish Military History for hosting uh, this event today. And uh, certainly my thanks to my very good friend, uh, Harvey, for attending with me. And uh, certainly, too, to those that are, are watching this, I, I just hope that this webinar has, uh, in some fashion, um, cause you to rethink or, or or perhaps even learn some of the things that we advisors did uh, in Vietnam so many years ago. So thank you for your time and your for, for your attention. Thank you so much. Thanks everybody for being on. Oh, Harvey, do you have a final word? I just want to thank everybody for uh, uh, for attending this and to say that normally uh, veterans, including Vietnam veterans, uh, do not get a chance to talk about their experience much. And you have given both John and I a chance uh, to talk about it. But if you really want to know, buy his book. Yeah, we will send out a, a follow-up link with uh, uh, the recording of this talk and links to the book. And uh, thank you, everyone, for being on. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, John.